Okay, uh, this week we have uh, Chris Finch, uh, assistant coach with the uh, Houston Rockets. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, first of all, um, why don't we uh, why don't we just first ask uh, about your uh, about how much uh, the World Cup just ended uh, over the weekend, um, and uh, basically, I uh, was wondering how much you actually watched it. Um, there were there were uh, uh, four guys uh, from your team um, there uh, with uh, James Harden. Uh, Papa Nicolau who's coming in, uh, Mochi Yunus and, and Francisco uh, Garcia. Uh, in general, how much did you, how much did uh, Kevin McHale, the team in general, how much did you guys watch uh, the World Cup? Yeah, I uh, watched quite a bit, actually. Um, saw a lot of the early rounds all the way through. Uh, <clears throat> surprisingly, one of the only, uh, I, did, I missed the finals, <laughs> uh, but I saw, uh, saw a lot of the games and, of course, tried to focus as much on the guy, games where our guys were playing. Um, as well as you know, just other games of interest. Um, this is the first World Cup. Um, obviously, the Americans were the the main team that had uh, uh, some guys not there. France had a couple of uh, big names that weren't there. Uh, in general, uh, your thoughts about the the level of the of the tournament? I thought the level was pretty good as as, as ever. Um, you know, you know, of course. Uh, um, you know, Spain's disappointment, um, you know, kind of affected the, the finish, um, but uh, that we all anticipated. But I thought the level was high. One thing of note, you know, there's a uh, I haven't been in the international games for a while, uh, from 2006 to 2012. Uh, you know, very familiar with a lot of the nucleus of those teams, um, and I think you see those teams are getting a little bit older now. Um, at the end of their run, you know, uh, Turkey uh, starting to replenish a little bit now. Uh, Spain, uh, they've been around for a long, long time. Slovenia, uh, a little bit of change in the roster, but not a whole lot. Um, uh, you know, Serbia has done a good job of bringing in some some younger guys, as have France. Uh, you know, and that's why those teams are so strong. I think the other teams are just getting a little bit older every year, and it's probably time for them to revamp their lineups. Um, you've you've been around uh, the international game for a while, like you mentioned, um, and uh, even before that, probably have a, a at least a bit of an understanding. Um, where would you rank the France uh, upset of Spain um, in international basketball? Where would you where would you rank that? Well, it's you know it's certainly not there. Uh, not uh, it's up there, but you know it's not not amongst the the very top, which would be Russia being. The U.S. Greece beating the U.S. Uh, Russia beating Spain in Spain in the Euros a few years ago, um, but it's it, it you know it's a big big um, big win for that country uh, and that rivalry just keeps growing and growing you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Um, the um, you know, like you, like you mentioned, Spain are are getting a little bit older. Um, do you uh, and, and basketball is, is kind of uh, um, you know cyclical game, whereas countries kind of come and go a little bit more than than others. Um, do you see uh, who do you see as, as maybe the next uh, as the next power? Uh, do you see it being France now that kids like uh, Levan and, and Colbert and, and Hertel um, are able to to really uh, take more responsibility when when guys like uh, Tecolo and and uh, Parker and maybe Noah come back. Is is France another? Is is France sort of the next team to, to maybe be a challenge for this for the states, or or or, or do you see it somebody Absolutely, else? Absolutely, yeah. I think, yeah, I think uh, you know France is definitely on the rise, getting better. Again, they're get, they're having they're infused with young talent as well as experienced talent. You know that's that's kind of the blend that will that you that works. Uh, Serbia is the same way. Um, you know, I, if you look at you look at uh, what happened with Spain. Um, it's very similar with with Lithuania in uh, 2011 with their Euro Championships. You know they they have a, a a collection of great players and they've been together for a long time. But they're you know maybe just a little bit past their prime, or some of them are a little past their prime at the international level. They don't have that mix of necessarily uh, young 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 talent 
on the rise with uh, experienced talent. And, you know, both of them kind of, you know, ran out of, for whatever reasons, they kind of ran out of steam and really didn't, didn't make it to the finals, didn't win in their own country, which is what the buildup had been all along, you know. And that's why they kept those guys together and great servants to the program. So they deserve a chance to be able to play for the World Cup in their own home country. But, um, you know, I think it's it, the, the national team level. Uh, the challenge is to keep bringing in that young talent at the bottom end. I mean, we were never able really to do it with Great Britain because we just didn't have the depth of talent that those other countries have. But, you know, you got to make some tough choices and we'll bring those younger players in and as well as keep those uh you know, existing veterans. Uh, you brought up GB, and uh, you figured it uh, it'd have to come up eventually. Um, you were at uh, two Euro baskets, and then also at the at the Olympics uh, in, in London. Um, they've uh, you know they've been fighting now uh, very hardly for the la- for since then, and even you know during your time, I'm sure as well uh, for for monies. Um, how would and then obviously failed uh, in the uh, um, failed to qualify for uh, for even Eurobasket 15 uh, weren't at the World Cup. Um, how would you assess where where they're at right now with at least your understanding of the background and 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 keeping up with it uh, um, as much as you have? Yeah, I mean it was a disappointing summer. Obviously, a disappointing summer. Unable to build on any of the momentum. Um, but we were uh, able to establish uh, uh, over that a very good showing at the at the Euros. But um, you know the fun- the funding has been pulled, uh, and that was pr- going to happen and has been happening over the last eighteen months, uh, and that makes it hard. I get that, and you know some of their marquee players have not been involved in the program due to variety of commitments, be it personal or you know, professional clashes with injury, rehabilitation, or, you know, some of the guys were just obviously looking for maybe a summer off here and there after, um, you know, being together for so long in the run-up to the Olympics. So there was a lot of factors that contributed to it. I know that the the players that um, did show up and I know them well, they, they're, they're committed, they played hard, they represented well. Um, but it was disappointing um, to see them to see them not be able to qualify because it was a huge step backwards, and um, you know. But uh, hopefully, it allows us to refocus our, our energies or their energies, and you know, get going in the right direction again. What do you What do you think needs to be done, in, in the situation where they're at now? Um, well, I think it's 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 a. Uh, it's a, it's a tricky question. I think you know the, the game is is not big enough in the UK uh, where you can have the league, the leagues, the federation, and the national team all kind of working in silos. They they've got to find a way to come together. The the the, the BBL, the British Basketball League, has got to make a commitment to. Uh, developing and playing younger players um and the national team has got to uh find a way of dovetailing its its efforts um in line with those clubs because those clubs um are really the best structures to be able to deliver young talent now there's got to be a give and take there and that's not existed on a um on a consistent enough basis there you know everybody's got kind of their own idea and the game's not big enough there's not enough money to go around there's not enough quality coaches to go around there's not enough depth of talent to go around right now um and uh they got to find a way to come together i mean there's a lot of talk right now about blowing it all up and you know nothing in british basketball is good or uh useful but that's that's not a very uh realistic nor um, viable plan in my mind because there are uh, talented people within the game, people with good ideas, um, and and those you know those structures and um, that do exist need to be you know need to be brought together uh, because that's the best chance to get back to a level of competitiveness competitiveness quickly enough. Um, and, you know, again, it starts, I think, with a big commitment from the clubs 
to to go to more full time training, more full time coaches, um, and and a commitment to develop younger players. Um, and there's a lot of things that would go into that, but uh, I think think that's the best chance that they have to kind of fast track themselves. Um, move uh, in, in your career um, over to the the D League. Um, mm-hmm. You you spent two years there. Um, how, how is it? How is coaching different um, in a league where sort of most of the players uh, have the primary goal of moving up to the next level? Um, and and is there is there at all the the uh, a sense that the team ball is second or uh, what what's what's your opinion about that? Well, first of all, coaching in the D League uh, was one of the best coaching experiences that I've ever had, and I've had a lot of different ones. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it really it uh, made me a better coach. And the reason it makes you a better coach is because you have to continually reshape and reshuffle your team throughout the season. Um, you've got to find ways to, you know, uh, get to the same results with different raw materials. I mean, most leagues, if, as I say in Europe, you know, when I was there for a while, if we had a problem with a player or he wasn't doing what we had thought he was going to do, we could, we could change him, bring in a new one, you know, so you're usually getting rid of your problems, whether they're not good players or, you know, pers- locker room problems or whatever. But in a D league, you're always losing your best players. You know, and that's that alone, you know, presents a huge challenge. So, um, you get you usually get good ones and re, and replace to replace them, but the whole foundation of your team is built around your best players. So when they go, you got to kind of change without without losing your integrity or without losing your philosophy. Um, you do that several times a year. Um, so that that that's a, a a unique challenge to the league. Uh, I had someone tell me one time, and you know, the D League's the only league in the world where you, at the end of training camp, you have, you know, fifteen, twenty guys all trying to make the team. And the day after training camp, that they all make the team, they all want to be somewhere else. They don't ever want. They don't want to be in the D League. They want to be in the NBA. They want to get a buyout to go to Europe. You know, <laughs> and uh, and and again, that's not too far from the truth. So, uh, building a team uh, where uh, you know, you can keep players engaged, um, and you know they're not making a lot of money, so they're not doing it for financial uh, rewards. Uh, it helps when you have a you know great uh, relationship or you're part of a NBA team because you know they can see then that there is an end goal, and that if they're being evaluated by you know the, the parent club as well as other teams. So uh, there's a lot of challenges in the D League. Uh, makes it a unique place, but I also makes it a uh, very, you know, the great platform for evaluating talent, the great platform for coaches, uh, referees, players, you know, even front office people to come through to the NBA, which is really what the purpose it serves. So. Um, if you have, if you, if you have a, uh, let's say a young European talent um, who might not be good enough for the NBA. Uh-huh. Sort of, um, would you? How would you? How would you go about sort of, you know, distinguishing? Say, all right, go to the D League or stay with a club in Europe and and develop certain things there. Well, I, with, I mean, with I the goal, always, the the end goal of the player is the NBA. Yeah, I, I advise a lot of players that, um, you know, that they should definitely, if they have, you know, if they're on NBA radar and they have NBA aspirations. Um, they should at least spend uh, one, if not two, years in the in the D League. I think if you, you know, push it out to three, four, five years in the D League, you've probably missed your missed your chance. Um, European kids, it's uh, it, it's similar. Um, maybe they spend less time. Maybe they come over for a year after they're somewhat established in in Europe. I think a lot of European big guys would do well in the D League because. The D League uh, tends to have more undersized athletic bigs, and European players with size and with skill will do very well, and they'll learn to compete against high-level athletes every single night. Um, a guy like, you know, from our GB setup, who I think would have benefited greatly from the DB, the, the D League, would have been a guy like Dan Clark. You know, had come over for a year um, and play in the D League. Maybe he still can. 
Um, you know, because he's highly skilled, he understands the game well, he's got legitimate size. Um, and, you know, he get a chance to really be able to show that in an in NBA, you know, set up, if you will, NBA style game. So, um, you know, I definitely think it's, uh, there's, there's more movement than ever. You know, there's always been a lot of movement with, you know, Americans going to Europe, but, um, of course in the last 10 years, 15 years, we've seen the, the flood of European and international players coming into the NBA, but I think you'll see more and more now coming into the D league, um, especially with the financial troubles in Europe, um, that have been hitting some clubs and the more and more NBA teams that are involved with on, in one-on-one relationships, either owning their D league club or working in a hybrid scenario, like, like the minor league baseball, uh, arrangement with major league clubs like we have here, you know, you're going to be able to go and say, Hey, these guys are highly interested. Let's recruit them to our D league team. Let's put them down there. Let's evaluate them. Let's develop them. And let's see if they really do have, um, some NBA potential in a low risk environment. You know, we don't have to sign them to a, a big contract. We can have them take a little bit of bet on themselves. We can take a bet on themselves and we can see if it works out and then we can bring them along at a more, you know, rational pace, if we will. Um, you had you had Albrecht there, right? Tim Albrecht, right? He was at the Rio Valley, Rio, uh, Rio Grande. The German. I'm sorry, you, the, the beginning of that question. You, you, you had German. You had uh, Tim Albrecht there, right? The uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Tim Albrecht is a good example of that. I think. Yeah. Tim, I think. That, I think. Um, you know, Tim is. I think there'll be there'll be other players along the same line that could do have similar success, not better than Tim. Yeah. Um. Move over to uh, to Cleveland um, with uh, David Blatt, the signing of David Blatt. Obviously, that that made big uh, international basketball uh, headlines. Mm-hmm. Um, being an American who has a long, uh, you, you know, even say storied uh, uh, history in in European basketball, um, what do you you know? There's speculation on what it might mean for Americans coaching in Europe. Uh, what do you? What kind of effect do you think that might have? Um, you know. And 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 is it really reliant on how successful uh, David is in in in, uh, in Cleveland, or is just the fact that he's over that he's already been recognized and brought over to to Cleveland already that first step? Well, I think I mean first of all, you know, David, uh, I know him, I know him well. Played against his teams uh, at international level. Um, he's an outstanding coach. He's uh He's, he's obviously a proven coach at a, at a high level. He's an NBA quality coach in terms of the way he thinks the game and manages the game. Um, and, you know, I'm sure if given um, enough time and opportunity, he's going to be a success here, you know. Um, and he, he's got, obviously, a, a team that is going to be competing for the championship, so he's going to be able to put it, all of his skills to, to, to work right away. I don't think the future of other um, – European coaches coming coming across or American coaches have been in Europe coming back necessarily hinges on uh, David's success or not. What you know, I think you'll you're seeing now a lot more NBA teams looking between the cracks for coaching candidates. We want fresh blood, fresh ideas. Uh, doesn't matter where they come from. I mean, our D League coach Nevada Smith, we uh, dug him out of a small Division three school in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, you know, and now he's an integral part of our setup here and and on a fast track to, to be joining the staff here at the Rockets one day. Um and, you know, two years ago he 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 would have never thought he would have been there. So, you know, we're and that's good. I mean the the, the there's more and more um you know movement of of uh, coaches just like there has been of players now all around the world. Uh, European assistant coach uh, just got on board at OKC, was their D-League coach before that. What I would say is, um, you know, like a lot of things in pro sports, things go in trends, can tend to be a little bit of a copycat league. And, um, you know, if if they, David has great success, then maybe it'll spur more teams to do more. And, um, you know, there'll be another trend around the corner on what, what teams were trying to do with coaches, um, you know, when, when, when someone finds something that works. Um, let's move to your team, uh, Houston. Um, obviously, from, a, from an international basketball standpoint, there's uh, a couple of, of, of guys that people uh, are interested in seeing. 
Um, yeah. Uh, your thoughts about, uh, or what, what kind of expectations does uh, Costa's Papa Nicolau come? Uh, obviously, uh, making uh, three Final Fours in a row, winning twice with uh, Olympiacos. So what kind of ex- Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, sorry, you just cut out. What kind of expectations do we have for Costas? Yeah, yeah, exactly. What kind of uh, expectations do you have for him? Uh, we have high expectations for him, but we, you know, we know we understand there's a learning curve that he's going to go through, um, adjusting to the NBA, adjusting to life in America. So, for you know, for that matter, we we you know, we're going to need him to play and play well. And there's no doubt about it. The way our roster is structured. Um, He's perfect for us off the bench. Uh, he's going to be able to play two or three different positions. Um, you know, we like to play small. We can we can see us using him as a small four to really run run the floor. So we love his activity. We love his toughness. We love the fact that he can make impact on the game without having the ball in his hands a ton. Um, we think he's a perfect complement alongside James and Dwight. Uh, we love his IQ. Um, and more than anything, and as I keep telling guys uh, here who aren't as familiar with him, is like he wins. You know, he has those winning intangibles. Wins where wherever he has been, um, he's never been the star, but he's been probably uh, one of the coach's most important pieces. If you would ask the coach, so I think that speaks a lot about him as a player, certainly as a person, and we uh, hope to benefit from that. And if we can get him. Uh, up to speed quickly, and uh, you know he he can do what we think he can do in the in the league. Then we're going to be fine. Um, what about Do- uh, Donatas uh, Motiunas? Um, kind of uh, had had some up and downs uh, uh, in general with the club. Um, thoughts about him and 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 what you what kind of role you guys expect for him? Yeah, big year for uh, for Demo. Um, you know, I know he's been frustrated with his role over the last couple of years, but he, you know, he, he, we're we're pretty happy with where he has been and where where he's come from. Um, he, uh, you know, he just puts a lot of pressure on himself. He works so hard and he wants it so badly. Um, but uh, we see him along with Terrence Jones, you know, as uh, kind of a two-headed four-man. Um, we think he's a a great complement to Dwight. He can. You know, he, he struggles to shoot the ball. Like he's not the classic stretch four and doesn't have the shot that most uh, European bigs can, can have. Um, but he can do a lot of other things. He can really put the ball in the deck. He's a clever passer. He's a very good low post scorer. He runs the floor extremely well. He's a smart defender. He understands pick and roll coverages. He understands team defense. We just need him to rebound a little bit better. If he can make some shots for us on a more consistent basis from the perimeter, um, you know, he can stay out of foul trouble, which is something that's bo- uh, plagued. And he plays so physical uh, in a way that uh, you can in Europe. But he's made been a little bit slower to adjust to some of the, to the calls here in, in the in the U.S. But if he can do those things um, and take a step forward, I know he's had a good summer, had a really good summer, um, and you know, in many ways. Uh, he can, you know, he can be a big piece of uh, what we're trying to do, whether it be as a starter or off the bench. Um, you guys just uh, actually just yesterday, uh, the the uh, at the time of the recording, uh, brought in uh, JC uh, Jason Terry, um, obviously an experienced guy. Uh, um, what what kind of uh, what kind of uh, expectations do you have him? What what do you what do you guys want out of him? Uh, sort of as the the leadership role off the bench. Is that where you're guys thinking? Well, I've, I mean that that's actually not been officially completed. It's uh, there's some I don't know I don't know what the particulars are of that of that uh, potential transaction. So I really okay. really shouldn't speak on that right now. So. Okay, so no problem. Um, yeah. uh, there there are two other guys I wanted to ask you about. One of them is um is uh is uh, Clint Capella. Uh, somebody. Uh-huh. That uh, that people here in, in Europe um, are are kind of excited about. Um, how, how what what do you want him to work on? Um, I assume he's staying over here in Europe. And, and what do you want him to work on? Uh, we you know we're 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 really excited to have him, and um, we think that he fits uh, our system well. Um, you know he's gonna have to work on his physicality. 
he's a tough kid. I don't think no anyone no one questions his toughness. Um, but he's got to obviously be be more physical. A similar situation with Demo. You know, Demo is a tough kid, but he's just got to learn how to play with physicality um, and not have it affect his game. So Clint's going to have to adjust to that. Um, and you know, we 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 want him to you know do what he does well. We we're not trying to get guys to change their game too much. They have a skill set or an expertise that got them to this level. We want to continue to develop that and nurture that. So that's for us running the floor real well, finishing around the rim, um, and then being a, a rim protector on the level of uh, Serge Ibaka, if you will. Uh, we see he has you know that type of potential in him. Um, you know he's got a soft touch. Uh, we like that. We see how far we can stretch him out uh, to make jumpers in and around the paint. Um, and uh, I see the little bit we've been able to work with him. He picks things up quickly. Um, and he's fit in, you know, so far socially uh, and adapted well to to life over here. So, you know, he's, he's an intelligent kid. He's got a lot of things going for him. So we we think that he's got a, a big upside. He'll spend, um, you know, the bulk of the year in the D League, which will be great for him. Okay. Um, and um, you know, we'll see uh, where he is at the end of that year. But we expect him to make big strides. So you're definitely going to keep him over over there. Uh, and, and have oh yeah, he's staying here. There's no doubt about it. He's staying okay, here. okay. Um, last guy is a guy that I've seen a couple of times, also in high level competitions. Uh, Alessandro Gentile uh, just can do a lot of different things. Um, how excited was the organization uh, to get a guy like him? Uh, uh, obviously through the trade, but uh, to get a yeah. guy to get a guy like him uh, to you know maybe down the road uh, eventually come into the organization. Oh. Really excited, and I was particularly excited because I got to work with him um, at last year's Euro Camp. He was um, he was actually on the team that I coached, so I had kind of firsthand working knowledge of of the kid. Um, I, I I like him a lot. I think he fits our system again very well. Uh, high basketball IQ has toughness. Um, what I love about him is he's he's deceptive, like he. He's, you know, a little bit stronger, a little bit tougher, a little bit more athletic than people uh, think when they first look at him. Um, he, you know, would have been a really good um, a good option for us this year. We tried to get him to come this year. I think we were already locked into a deal, you know, particularly after we lost him with Parsons. You know, we need that cleverness at the wing position. Um, and uh, a guy that is a bit of has a bit of a playmaking uh, um, quotient to him. So... Uh, as well as a guy who can who can finish and uh, operate in tight spots. So yeah, we're I mean, we're, you know, we're we're again really we 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 lucked, lucked out on the guys in, in the international market that were available to us because we also felt that they were the best players available at the time and they were great system fits. Um, when when people look at the roster, you know they see. Uh, Capella, they see uh, Garcia. I mean, okay, he came up through through high school and college, but Motunas, uh, Papa Nicolau, Gentile, you know, uh, might you know, you said you wanted him there, um, and you know, people might be thinking of uh, your neighbors there in 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 in, uh, in Texas, San Antonio, with the international. Uh-huh. Um, is is that something that uh, that the club is? Let's say uh, consciously looking at, or, or or is it just something a, a development of the game? Uh, whereas these guys are 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 the people that you sort of see as uh, the best fit into um, into the rest uh, of what you have. Well, it's it's mostly the development of the game because there's there's good players all over the world now, and and uh, the Rockets are big uh, you know big followers and. Supported supporters of international basketball. I mean, um, we scout the world. Um, we we support our guys when it's time for them to play for their national programs. We think it's uh, you know it's a benefit to us ultimately, and um, we learn a lot along the way. Uh, we lo- we we like the European or the international kids um, for their approach. Um, many of them come because they're fairly established and they have a more defined uh, game or skill set at that point in time. And um, yeah, of course you're taking some upside bet with them, but um, perhaps not as much as you do with the kids in the um, coming out of college, you know? Uh, so reason it, 
you, you can draw a parallel to the Spurs is because, you know, they're looking for specific players that do specific things that fit in around their, their three star, superstars, if you will. Um, and, you know, you tend to find that in more established players. And, and you know, that oftentimes is, is the European guy who's a little bit more um, of a veteran, if you will, at a younger age. Yeah. Um, I guess I can call the one uncomfortable question. Uh, in, Ju- in July, uh, James uh, stated that uh, he goes to, to White and I are the cornerstones of the Rocket. The, the rest of the guys are role players or pieces that complete our team. Um, afterwards, uh, you know, rumors that Harden and, and Howard were a bit separatists. Uh, with their regards to their teammates. Um, how how does the coaching staff deal with this sort of issue? Well, first of all, I can tell you that, uh, you know, the separatist comment's simply not true. They're they're very highly engaged with their teammates. Uh, anyone who's been uh, around Dwight knows that he's uh, super inclusive, very uh, good-natured and fun and funny guy in particular, and he likes... Um, you know, to basically hold court and, (laughs) and the guys like to, uh, you know, you know, give and take with him. James is, uh, not quite as gregarious, but, you know, equally engaged with his teammates. He's got a high number of teammate friends. They do a lot of things together. So, you know, those were kind of taken out of context. It was unfortunate, but, uh, we don't pay too much attention because we know the truth here. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as the role player comment, the reality is, you know, the bulk of the NBA are role players, mm-hmm. and that's not a bad thing. I mean, players need to know at the highest level. Players need to know who they are and what they do well, and how they can help a team win. How can they can keep a job? How can they stay on the floor? Um, when players try to do those things that they can't do well, it's not good for anybody. Um, and of course, there's always a natural pecking order. Uh, there's a natural pecking order in all of sports and business and any competitive element. And, um, you know, I think what James was saying and Dwight was saying is that the pressure's on them to deliver for the team, um, uh, first and foremost. They're, they're actually with taking, uh, responsibility for, you know, the team's results, uh, much more so, um, than they were trying to say that they're more important than anybody else. They said they're the ones who get paid the big, big contracts. They're the ones who deal with the media scrutiny. They're the ones that, you know, get the ball at crunch time. So they're the ones that feel the pressure and they have to live up to that. And, um, and I think that's, it, it's a, it's a coming of age mentality for them that, that, that they're, we're going to live and die with their performances. Um, and, uh, there's a lot of, there's, you know, there's a lot of pressure on that. And, uh, I think that's really what the comment was about. It was less about, you know, anyone not equal, uh, of, of equal importance, you know, um, on a more positive note, then let's let's say uh, uh, James was obviously he was uh, considered for uh, considered uh, for the all tournament team at the World Cup. Um, how how good do you think it was for him to to go um, to Team USA, uh, be the captain, and uh, and really uh, really play quite impressively there? Um, looking forward to what you guys hope will be a big year this year. How important was was Harden's performance over in Spain? I think James had an amazing summer. Um, obviously capped off with the with the gold medal in Spain, uh, but it was a process of you know work and commitment that led up to that. He had a he had great uh, training period going into it. He he dropped some weight. He looked good. He felt good. He was ready. His mind was in the right spot. Um, you know, then when Kevin Durant decided to withdraw from the team, I was proud of James for the way that he stepped up in a leadership capacity um, as well. And, you know, and Coach K gave him the captaincy. And I thought James, you know, from the outside, obviously, uh, the results were excellent. And the team chemistry looked good. James was a big role, um, but was also happy to, you know, uh, take, joy, take joy in the success of his teammates and in all the things that, uh, you know, winning teams do. And I thought he, you know, I know he's super, super juiced up about it. And he's got a lot of, you know, a lot of energy coming out of that. So, you know, that alone 
is huge for him. Again, people forget how young young some of these guys uh, are, you know, and James has gone from being the third guy in OKC to the number one guy here to having to share a number one, um, and now he's got a chance to lead a team. Like, that's all in, in, inside three years, you know, that's a – or even two and a half years. That's a lot of – a lot of things, you know, in the growth of a young player that will only help benefit him and hopefully us. So. Uh, you guys uh, exited in the uh, after the first round. Uh, Portland got you in six. Um, let's let's put it this way: uh, biggest reason why you guys will make the finals, uh, and what do you need to do to uh, to win the championship? The biggest reason why we'll make the finals this year uh, will be because we will have, you know, an improved defensive uh, approach and attitude. You know, we, 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 we're committed to running. We're committed to our style of play, but we have to complement that with uh, tougher defensive uh, mindset, higher amount, of, higher level of accountability, um, you know, across, of, across our players and, and just, you know, being able to just uh, get our defense into the top, top, you know, top ten defenses in the league. Um, if we can do that and balance it with our offense, I think we'll have, uh, you know, a chance to make a good little run in the playoffs. Um, all right, I think I will let you go with that. I we totally appreciate you coming on, uh, taking so much time out of I know a uh, busy schedule. Even though you're gonna, you're not the, you're not yet at training camp, but uh, it's right around the corner now. Okay, I appreciate it. Thanks, thanks so much. All right. Thanks. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.